Uh, <clears throat> this is, let me start with the, with the phrase, free land. Um, uh, that's the general rallying call or cry of the new African independence movement, um, which is a historic tendency within what we would frame the, the black liberation movement. Um, and summarizing um, and reducing very significantly, there's kind of like three ten, ten tendencies within the black liberation movement, at least how the, the forces I came out of, we would kind of define it. So there's uh, one <clears throat> um, radical notion, which is about basically, you know, uh, radically transforming the United States empire, uh, you know, and, and turning it into like a socialist, um, communist society republic, right? Um, and uh, black people playing a, a key role, if not an integral role, in, in making that transformation. That's one kind of tendency. Uh, the other tendency is about dismantling the, the empire, uh, so that there would be, you know, uh, a new Africa, um, sovereign and independent, Puerto Rico free, uh, indigenous nations free and independent and sovereign, sovereign Hawaii, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Aslan, you know, being its own, Khalifa Aslan being its own uh, uh, independent kind of nation state uh, as a mean of dismantling, you know, this this kind of heron vogue white republic that's been built um, from this, it's not fair to call it exactly an English settler colonial project. It's a multi-European settler colonial project that's dominated by the English language. But um, uh, so that the, the call comes from that particular uh, or then the third one, I mean, they say it is, is uh, folks who've been advocating for kind of a radical pan-African orientation, which includes also movements to, to leave the United States, mainly to go back to Africa, but historically there's been folks who've been, you know, looking to go to Belize or looking to go to uh, uh, Honduras or uh, other places that were, have been open at different points in time, Haiti uh, being one. Uh, so those are kind of the three kind of tendencies, and, and we come out of one in particular. Uh, and it grows out of kind of two things. Um, uh, one, this was a movement, there was a, already a cry that was being uttered by forces in uh, South Africa, but particularly in Namibia, uh, who were using that phrase, right, in the late 60s. Uh, also aspects of that were being used uh, in Angola and in, and in Mozambique. So kind of our movement picked that up at a very critical time. Uh, but it became kind of the general rallying crawl in, in Jackson, Mississippi in 1971, where uh, uh, the Republic of New Africa, the Provisional Government Republic of New Africa, and the house right around the corner from, from our house, uh, decided that they were going to, to try to establish a political capital, uh, you know, to, to uh, make a direct declaration of the push for sovereignty and self-determination from the United States government. that wind up being attacked by the FBI uh, uh, the Mississippi Bureau of uh, Investigation and Jackson Police Department wound up getting into uh, a shootout that lasted uh, two days starting on August 21st, 1971. But it was in the context of that month of all this agitation that was leading to that where an effort that was being made to purchase some land wound up being challenged and the cry free the land that came from these other movements became a rallying piece. Um, now, um, what we've tried to do uh, um, is try to operate, operationalize that demand within the limited context of uh, the balance of forces that, that presently exist. Meaning, uh, we can't defeat the United States toe to toe, uh, blow to for blow, um, to like take some land. Like, that's not possible right now. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it, it, we're, we're trying to engage, and sometimes I like this phrase, sometimes I don't, but I think it's kind of helpful. Like, we're trying to engage in an element of, of um, what do you call it? Um, uh, revolutionary reform, what's the phrase? The, the, like, reformers. You, you help me out. I don't like the phrase, so it's, it's slipping my mind right now. Non-reformist reforms, right? So we've been trying to engage in kind of non-reformist reforms of saying, 
this, the, this is what we can do within kind of the confines, confines of the present law and legal system, political system, economic system, um, to buy some time and create some operating or democratic space for us to, op to move within. So we've been buying as much land off the speculative, speculative market in primarily West Jackson as a as kind of a concentrated base area. And we chose West Jackson because that is the historic area where the new African independence movement of which we are a, you know, a, 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 an element of, it had a base there that's, that's been in that community going back to the late 1960s. So it's not by accident, it's not random. You know, it's building upon the foundation. So we, are, we try to anchor ourselves there and buy up as much land as possible. And with that <clears throat> is the establishment of the, the community land trust. But with on that is what we're trying to, to do all of our programmatic work on as a base and to try to do it systemically so that we could build <clears throat> uh, worker co-ops, uh, which has kind of been like the, one of the main forms of, of what we've been doing, um, <clears throat> a, a urban farming co-op, uh, various experimentations with the recycling and composting co-op. Uh, we, we've done a couple, they failed. We're doing one now, it looks like it's finally going to actually work. Um, you know, uh, a green team, which is cutting lawns, uh, community production co-op, several things. So that's our kind of like the core area of our kind of materially grounded work, but it's with the objective primarily building a level of political autonomy and self-determination within our community that we can create enough material kind of security for our, our base of folks. They don't have to work for other people on their own terms and that then allows them to be active political subjects in order to engage in other activities. That, and so we're trying to get to a point like Saki was saying, imagine, a, imagine you know, uh, uh, an army of black women who don't have to worry about childcare or where their next bill is coming from. Mm. What could they do, mm. right? I think they can move some, some mountains. We haven't gotten it there completely yet, but that is the objective of what we're actually trying to do. If you was to add it up, it's about, about 10 acres. No, it's more like 45 parcels. But I mean, the, they range in size, um, and the majority of the land is vacant. Um, but we have um, three residential homes uh, with tenants that are members of Cooperation Jackson. Um, we have one um, uh, house that has provided housing for members um, that's uh, the plan has been for it to be like a sliding scale of solidarity housing. People want to come and instead of paying the hotel, um, can support us. Um, come, and so that, and like yeah, that. Um, and, and so we've been the last couple of years going through a, a round of rehab, renovations and repairs to property. Um, and so that house is going to be back online soon. Um, we do have a couple of places that um, are vacant. Um, and you know, kind of going through the phases of being able to self-finance renovations. Uh, we have three major um, commercial spaces, including um, a couple of years ago, we were able to get the, there's a shopping, a small shopping plaza right down the block from our like home base. Um, and so now we have the Ida B. Wells Plaza um, and about three of the pieces of property have been space for freedom farms to do urban agriculture, um, farming, gardening. Um, so yeah, so I mean, it's a significant amount of property in the neighborhood. Yeah, that because there's so much of it that is vacant is an opportunity for us to envision what like land use in the community. But let's not forget that in terms of the last question, um, the sum of the parts are sometimes very different than the whole. So the, the, the utter significance of what Saki just said and, and Kali laid out as a framework in terms of very specific plans for very specific plots of land, very specific uses now and ideas for the future. Constant growth is amazing and also you know, a relatively small plot of land 
and you've elected a mayor once or twice, and oh my God, obviously you wanna get all white people out of the entire state of Mississippi. <laughs> and while we can laugh at that, at the absurdity of it, uh, it's also true on a certain level that when you look at the history of revolutions in the last 100 years, for example, we're never talking about 51% of the people mobilized for revolution. So let's look at the numerics. It is a good question, it's an important question, it's an inspiring answer, but the sum of the parts are always a bit different than simple numerics or majoritarianism. What Cooperation Jackson does in terms of consciousness on the, and then naming these places, Ida B. Wells, Fannie Lou Hamer, there was a Quasi Balagoon Center, if you don't know who Quasi is, there's a book about him in the back. See, Stephen, I do. <laughs> Get it in there. <laughs> you know, naming these names and putting them out there, it's more than just how much land. It's about consciousness in the community, and it's huge. And it's, it's an understanding that these two exemplary, extraordinary organizers have, and their whole crew, that understands it's both the very practical and very concrete and very specific, but it's also the consciousness raising, the mobilization, the idea of the possible which is what Cooperation Jackson presents. Yeah, I have a question, kind of already uh, brushed up on it, but um, I'm a uh, white leftist from Arkansas. Um, and I'm We're really coming to Arkansas in February. Oh, mm, I, I will we are. It, but <laughs> Just <laughs> a second. Uh, really inspired by your work. And, um, you know, no, I, I've so. thought a lot about like cycles of both state repression and divisiveness within leftism that's like results in like, collective amnesia. Like we forget a lot of the learnings of past before us, a lot of interpersonal healing and strategies for that have been lost to time. And you know, it, it, learning about the black radical tradition or the black liberation movement felt like sort of slurping a soup through a straw to like get at that when I was younger. Um, but I've been privileged enough in my older, as I've gotten older to travel to other countries and see these kind of concrete material um, land, of land that leftists have kept and held on to, and there's almost like an ability to imbue those learnings into the land, into those structures they build together, um, that fights this amnesia that, that comes with these struggles. Um, and I'm just curious, I'm just curious to hear more about like, your thoughts um, on this land, memory, and liberation as they relate to one another. I think that that's been difficult here. I don't, I don't know if I have uh, the sides that I would like to have and say and offer, but I think that the part that makes that hard here in our community is very intentional um, violence and very intentional um, aims of stripping us from that, right? And even if it's not um, burning a whole town down now, it is the withholding of resources and the exploitation of labor that makes it difficult for black folks to, to remember, affirm our history of, you know, like, Sheer sur like survival um, and the ways that we um, had strong communities um, in, 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 in order to survive. And so the history is withheld. Um, you know, if you have to do nothing, <laughs> if you like all your time is spent trying to figure out how to keep a roof over your head and pay some bills that you need in order to have water or the lights on, or that you can't even necessarily do that, but you accept being able to figure out which bills you're gonna pay and which different months and which one can, you know, like collect for a while, then your connection to each other, your connection to property, your connection to land, like your ability to have any time to do anything else, I, I think, you know, withholds that. Um, and so, the, the consistent strength of culture and that, you know, being robbed 
and and you know and then trying to be stomped out when glimmers of it are kindling um, is one of the big differences that I see here compared to when we've been other places. And even in the current conversations that we're having around the um, social digital infrastructure and being able to exchange goods and services without using um, you know, the US dollar, uh, one of the questions that's coming up is like, can we do it here? Is it viable now? And I think what we're having to think about is like, what do we need to build in order to get there? Because there are systems and cultures and practices that exist in a place like one of the examples that we're looking at heavily and building relationships with is in Kenya. But like those practices are there and they're able to build on them in order to create this alternative um, system of, of ex exchange. And it's not only the system of exchange, it's the collective work practice and rotation that also happens along with it. So, you know, I think that um, for us, arts and culture um, is also a big part of our work. And when we, early on, were looking at Mondragon as an example, there, you know, there's um, part of the practice is not only like doing the work of, you know, I don't know, doing cooperative training, but it's like creating the space and the ongoing uh, education for it to like stick and for it to become, uh, for it to become a norm. Mm. Um, and I'm not sure, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm not sure about the land memory part. I, I, I mean, I think the land, I think what you're talking about is, is what we're trying to get at with even like having people feel good about growing things again and like touching <laughs> soil and growing food. Um, I think that um, interestingly, like being in Jackson, being in Mississippi early on, I kept on having this, um, I kept on having this thing about water. And I think part of it was because like the water is not able to, you know, consume the water and the infrastructure is getting worse and worse, right? But like there, um, there, there is definitely like a feeling, I feel like for me, probably also spiritual in terms of like the land and being in that space and the longer like living there. Um, and sometimes I would decide to drive different ways to the center from home, which I could actually walk to. Um, it wasn't so hot. Um, and just kind of like look at and feel the vacant land that's around and 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 I guess help myself get grounded or regrounded in the sheer opportunity that exists um, because of having land and having it not be outrageous, like trying to get something um, and have cooperative housing in San Francisco. Um, but yeah, I think I think it's the I think it's the as we're able to um, consistently build our our muscles and our brain and our through practice that um, I think that that's gonna, <laughs> it's interesting I'm thinking about it this way, I'm thinking about a person in particular, it's gonna create those vibrations that um, when you say land and memory, it's making me think about, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you have a thought on that? I'm really quick, but oh, I'm yeah. gonna be real quick, all right. Let's do a little biology break here for a second, but just to say so we're, we're clear, uh, and I, I didn't say this yesterday because the Howard's in book fair that we're at uh, had amnesia as one of the sub themes against mm -hmm. amnesia. You know, a amnesia uh, as a concept is often thought of just familiarly uh, as a personal, as a psychological, as a medical condition. And I think we need to look at amnesia as a political campaign, as a cultural, social campaign. 
uh, that, the, that the State Department, the U.S. government, has very, very carefully masterminded. Amnesia is an act of uh, counter-revolutionary uh, upsurge. We are conditioned to, we are struggled with, um, we are, you know, inundated with newspaper clippings and everything, drug, to make us as uh, predictable, to, to create that amnesiatic uh, space. Uh, and the other side of that is some of the everyday practices that Saki was just talking about, um, you know, seem to be the, the nitty gritty work of getting your hands dirty, whatever that means and, and implies, getting your hands dirty. Uh, that's resistance, you know? I mean, that's active, that, that survival program, to use a Black Panther phrase, are acts of resistance. When some of us who are involved in this resistance studies network um, talk to some of the indigenous peoples back east, the Wampanoag peoples, and by the way, any of you who have young kids uh, and are therefore sometimes forced to watch <clears throat> the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, may have noticed that the Wampanoag float that they uh, did this year, because the Wampanoags, as the people of the first light, are sort of granted by Macy's and the corporate, uh, you know, because the Wampanoags are indigenous and semi-sovereign, not only do they have a float with some of their key people, but some of their key people had Palestinian flags on that float. It was a big uproar. Mm -hmm. And so when we talked to them about what, was, what resistance made to them 500 plus years, and they said, our survival is part of our resistance. Mm -hmm. So those everyday acts that Saki was talking about is resistance, just as amnesia is not a neutral or personal medical phrase. Mm -hmm. Does it have to be really intentional? Is it the, because I had turned it off and turned back on, okay. Um, it's gotta be really intentional about it, right? And so even thinking about what you said and maybe figuring out how to rephrase it, but having it be a question that's raised and that we discuss and talk about and have at the very forefront of like the other parts, like other, um, not consequences or byproducts, but what else come, like, what else comes out of what we're doing? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> There should be a um, session on your question um, alone um, on the real, because one of the things the new African independence movement has had to confront um, in terms of building kind of a mass consciousness is, is in part, you're asking <clears throat> a good number of folks who were forced out and who fled to San Francisco, to Oakland, to Richmond, to LA, <clears throat> Seattle, you know, yeah, San Francisco, you know, like you're, you're asking folks um, to return back to a site of trauma, mm -hmm. right? Um, and there is a deep collective trauma, you know, that, that black folks have about the South. Um, and it being kind of the, the, the epicenter, you know, the heart of empire, at least at relative to us, and, you know, what our role, uh, assigned role, was here relative to capital. Uh, and that is something being, you know, a member of this movement all my life, uh, members of my family be like, you know, why in the hell are you going back to Mississippi? You know, like, we, we left there for a reason, you know, kind, kind of thing. Um, and you know, it's always, well, what did you leave behind? Because LA, I'm from LA. LA ain't been paradise. That ain't, you know, like we, we survived. But it ain't like we necessarily thrived any better here than we did there. Um, but, so, but there is that memory there. But then there's another memory there. Uh, and, and, you know, I think we gotta be real that there's kind of, there's, there's a class component to this question of memory relative to your question. Um, you know, on one side of my family, uh, uh, well, uh, my maternal side of the family is from Mississippi and Louisiana. Um, and on one side of the family, uh, there was a fair amount of land ownership that, they, that was had. Um, you know, and it was, uh, um, 
you know, the, the white plantation owner who is an ancestor left his son, you know, at, at slavery, a fair amount of land, about 100 acres, and his folks have divided that up, basically. Uh, and I've been kind of on a, me and my older brother have been arguing with folks 30 some years, like don't sell, you know, or, or sell to us if they wanted the members, you know, most of whom had migrated to California. They were like, I ain't ever going back there. So, yeah, you know, yeah, y'all can have it or take it, whatever the situation is. But one of the things I've also noticed amongst some of them is that, you know, the, there's a certain amount of pride in, in uh, relating to the land and, and possessing, you know, land that you also kind of got to be careful with because it's like, those who kind of were forced out were not those to immediately forced out were not, you know, often in a relationship of owning any land. And the vast majority of black folks did not own land. Now, it's true that black folks owned more land before uh, the Great Depression than we own now. Uh, uh, you know, just to give you a sense of how vicious the system has, has been, even during this so-called period of integration and inclusion. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's not easy, and for, for me it's different since, you know, uh, uh, say Saki, you know, uh, I have very clear roots in my family to Mississippi that have been talked to me, I've been talked about and sent back there all my life. So I have a very clear, you know, this is home to me in a, in a deep way, and Saki's been to, you know, uh, uh, she's at least been to, you know, my family's land in, in uh, Louisiana. And there's a graveyard. Everybody in that graveyard is related to me. Every single person in that graveyard is related to me. And there's two little towns, you know, Gibson uh, uh, and, and Arcadia. Everybody in that town probably relate, is, is related to me. The black ones and the white ones, right? Like everybody in that town is related to me, uh, in, you know, in some way, right? And so there's, there's a way like that. No, this is, you know, I don't live there, but this is my home. I, you know, like this is, this is where I belong. I'm a product of this soil literally in my DNA. So for me, there's this, this kind of piece, and that's really strong for me, uh, uh, and that is Mississippi, because you know we can trace our ancestry uh, on my maternal grandfather's side. Uh, we can trace our, our history in that place for over 300 years since it was before it was founded. Mm -hmm. So for me, there's a way in which I relate to it just in my head, you know, and in my body in a very visceral way of like I belong there. You know, I mean, I lived there, but that's that's me. That's where I'm from. Right, and I can trace kind of an anchorage, you know, back there, and, and it's, it's just a, a level of, even though I don't live there now, ain't nobody ever gonna chase me away from that or dis, dislodge me of that memory. But it's, it's, it's contrast, it's, it's, you know, the thing that we're dealing with, I think, amongst black people in particular is this kind of, you know, yes, we were here, it wasn't pleasant, <laughs> you know, should we go back, what's the opportunity? And then I think there's a different way in which white folks relate to the land. And you know, younger white folks will become more conscious. We're gonna have to work on a program of our, how we all be in right relationship with this place and not just be invested in a, a consciousness of guilt. Uh, so it's like, I want you to, to acknowledge the deep hurt and misery and the suffering and the genocide that took place for all this to now, for all of us to be here, because that's the context and why all of us are sitting in this room right now. But how do we move past that? Not forget about it or just erase it, yeah. but like, well, how? Because that means different set of practices, not just land acknowledgement. It's like, is this concrete what's healthy for the land? Right? Is this way of doing things, is that healthy for the land? We already know the long term answer is no. Right? So, how do we start intentionally doing things different to be in a different relationship with Israel? And if we do that, then we create a new society, you know, like off the top. <laughs> um, uh, the colleague you had started with, um, you know, the campaign to be taken with telling your story, um, kind of thinking about like when you started with Nsaki, and Matt, you kind of uh, touched upon it, and, and maybe not to a certain degree, but um, Saki, I did, would you mind talking some more about those everyday stories and why they're important to the work that you're doing, but also just to the general movement, and it also relates to you know kind of how you started college or life, and then you know, 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 you know,
Scoop ourselves to get to another program across the bay. Um, if you can fit it in, it's fine if you can't. I just, in in reaction to you talking about uh, how we need coordination across like movements in the U.S., I'm just curious, like, what do you guys think that could look like? Like, do do we imagine it as like a vanguard party or like some like, networking, networking organization? Yeah. I, I'm just curious. Good question. Mm -hmm. so, thank you. <laughs> a, a, a roadmap because there's only obviously two minutes worth of questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll do the last one first a little bit, then maybe tell you the week and I'll start and we end with Saki for food money. Yeah, that's cool. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to say real quickly, I think in general, um, you know, I mentioned people's strife at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, we don't feel like uh, there's any one correct, perfect, positive strategy, tactical formation. So in general, we're not vanguardist. We're not exactly anti-vanguardist as, as an ideal, as a, as, a, as a project, but we don't necessarily think that, uh, you know, Saki said this amazing phrase yesterday, I've been quoting you about a hundred times in the last oh, yeah. 24 hours, quote, you know, about the cult of leadership. You know, we hear that a lot about the cult of personality. You know, we believe in leadership and we believe in structure. Uh, and even questions of discipline and cadre, but we don't believe that everyone has to be everything. And so I think in general, we're not part of a party together, <laughs> and we're not looking to build one. Um, but you know, People's Strike was an attempt to network many different people from different ideologies, but nonetheless, under some discipline, understanding of some basic principles, and the principles are ones that Khaled and Saki uh, laid out. So that's the beginning. I mean, there are coalitions. I work in the Spirit of Mandela Coalition that helped bring the U.S. Uh, charges of genocide and, and found the U.S. guilty of five charges of genocide against uh, human rights abuses against black, brown, and indigenous peoples. Non-sectarian, multi-ideological alliances. And, you know, how that's going to formate or play out in the next two, three, ten years will remain to be seen, but it's about some dialogical space for growing and working and building together. Yeah, I agree. With, I agree. I don't have no. I mean, no contradiction uh, with that. Really, just details maybe to, to kind of add on. But um, yeah, because that's different than like kind of a cadre. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, to be clear, I think that that say so like in your shop, you being a, a force of leadership within it that is always kind of reminding folks and finding folks also within the shop to be like, we need to ally with other co-ops and we need to ally with trade unions and we need to ally with women's groups. And you know what I'm saying? Like, 
there is an element of conscious leadership, which is not like I'm the vanguard that's got the line that's going to do X, Y. It's not that. Mm -hmm. right? I don't think it's that. I think that we, we, we've been there and we've done that. You know, my, my argument is if you're trying to take over the state, then Leninism is your best model, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but if you're trying to transform society, you don't want to do that. <laughs> that's, the wrong, that's the wrong structure, the wrong piece for, for, for trying to transform society. Um, so know what you, you know, it's like kind of know what you're trying to do and then build accordingly. Um, so I, I would, I would, I mean, I think there's a level now, I think just in terms of the, the this is how I see it, then I'll move on. We're, we're trying to, we're trying to speed yeah, up yeah. the time set. Uh, we're, we're at a phase of like consciousness raising to get people to see the need mm -hmm. uh, of for coordination, mm -hmm. right? Not impose it, because that's not gonna work, right? right? The need for coordination. What could co greater coordination help us do, right? And so it's just making an argument, like, hey, if we did, if we did do more coordination, we could improve, increase food production, right? Mm -hmm. And we all have a need in, in, in doing that, and we're all in, in, in involved in, in programs to do that. But then there's a certain level of challenge that's coming within the model of what I'm trying to articulate is like, okay, the, the mutual aid we, we do is dependent upon other people controlling the productive process. Like we're either buying food or we're dumpster diving or you know, we're robbing Peter to pay Paul. It's not contingent upon our actual production. And at some point, if we want to move it out of that kind of dependent relationship, which we can't count on, because the grocery store, I'm not giving you no more food. I'm not giving the food bank any more money to control prices, whatever. We have to be in productive you know, relationship with farmers to be like, Let's go immediately and deal with each other to meet this particular need, and we'll meet your needs in some other, you know, kind of way. And and the thing that I, the other part of this argument I've been trying to make, I have, I'm not trying to argue for. Uh, I'm a I'm writing a, a book about this, and the, the concrete piece I'm trying to write in the book is everything I'm arguing. There's been a concrete experience within our own lives about doing it. So folks want to know like this piece around the food production mutual aid. Look at the, 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 like between, I would argue, go back and look between March and June, uh, particularly in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, there was an example up in the Northeast where there was all this mutual aid that got coordinated and all these folks who were, particularly in the Midwest, directly working with farmers to get stuff straight from the farmers into uh, local urban uh, communities and just totally bypassed all this madness. Now, it, it worked within the sense of a crisis, and so we have to figure out how do we create a system that's beyond like crisis management and to make this more of a normative thing. But the, we, I'm talking about real things that we have already experienced or doing that we can kind of look at and replicate, not some abstract stuff. So not, not I'm not, I'm a, I love theory as much as anybody else, but I'm also been trying to take from, I'm a call Cabral, you know, who I'm a student of, make it practical. Whatever it is, make it practical. Um, and what was the other piece? This is kind of the art, yeah. the art healing, and yeah, the the. Young the that, I think it was the youth and. Those we can't. I would say honestly, we can't answer your question in full. The art and all this stuff is 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 integral to what we do. Um, half of our team are, are artists in one form, literally, yeah. uh, uh, graphic artists, poets, designers, very central to our work. Not developed by the public. Uh, that's one of our artists who, who, who did this, right? One of our members who did this. Uh, but we've been trying to articulate, this is why I'm saying it, just being real concrete. We've been trying to articulate a model of, we call it, you know, uh, it's a clumsy name, but an anti-capitalist business model. We've been trying to develop that for 10 years. Uh, we obviously haven't got there yet. Uh, but I think we've learned a few tricks of the trade around, you know, what do you, you know, like how to, how to do use, we, we, we're, our membership is now versed in use, production for use and production for exchange, meaning sale on the commodities market. And like we wanna do both. And like build, raising our capacity in terms of what we do, so there's a certain level of what we produce that's just gonna be recycled in the community without any monetary exchange. That's the use value. And then the other part, we're still in, since we're still embedded in overall capitalist relations, we got to produce enough to keep the lights on, right? But we don't control the electric company. Yep. We don't control the water company. So we still have to engage with that on a, in a practical level. But like, what what to what amount do we need to engage them? As opposed to producing on a level of like, I go beyond what I need to engage 
then I'm just accumulating to be accumulating. Yeah. So we're trying to figure that out, right? So the, I would say just being an honest dialogue with us, uh, and we can just tell you, hey, this is what we've learned. Some of it's worked, some of it hasn't. We're constantly experimenting and, and iterating on, on this. Yeah. My experience is not only young people. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah. Thanks for the questions. I'm not, um, the, sto yeah, the examples and stories. I think that I was trying to touch on and uplift like stuff that is kind of like on the sidelines or buried underneath. And I think one of the other things is, um, is um, us needing to and even individual people and this, um, is also um, an experience that I've had as seeing, um, see, seeing a, like me being able to tell of an experience or a story as being as valuable as writing something that's, um, that's focused more on the development of work and theory and ideology. Um, and so I think part of that was also why, um, why not only was it important for me to write something in addition to co-writing with some of the pieces or being in the interviews that um, got included. Um, and, you know, I surprised myself and was like, got affirmation and, um, and I'm glad that uh, you know, one of the one of the pieces is just kind of like what I'm calling creative writing because you know it's parts of it are somewhat poetic and rhyming and um, but it's you know like like stream of th thought type um, and and part of that is what I'm going to share. But you know the 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 ability to have memory um, and not have things kind of like hidden or taken from us is also in being able to document them. Um, and that's a really uh, big thing that um, I'm trying to figure out how to do projects around and go back to a project that me and Kali had kind of started and have been thinking about because a lot of our elders are at that point where they're transitioning um, and there's a lot that hasn't been documented. Um, and so, so yeah, I, I think that like, um, there are other examples in here also that I, I think are like, do a nice mix of experience along with, um, political practice and ideology and, 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 and posing questions and thinking, um, for folks to, uh, build on or see how you know it relates to their locations and their context and their conditions. Um, but yeah, the two things that are in this book um, that I did independently, I think are, um, are it's really vulnerable, <laughs> like making the, the experience, sharing the experience in a vulnerable way, I, I could say. Um, and I guess we have to um, be less fearful of that and understand that there's lessons to be um, gleaned from that type of storytelling and that type of documentation. Like, I, 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 it, the thought crossed my mind only really briefly, but I'm like, um, you know, I look forward to um, my two, I used to call them little people, and now they're like youth because they're almost teenagers. <laughs> um, being able to, you know, I have lived through it, but not really think about it or see it in the same way, and then being able to go back and, and, and read this, right? So, so that's cool. Um, although when I opened it up, I opened it up to the article, um, and one part out of the article that I wanted to share um, is dot, dot, dot. I point this out to say that real sacrifices must be made in our movement building work. Moving to Jackson, further away from my family, network of supportive friends, and work opportunities was no easy choice, but it was 
but is what was needed to add capacity to my former political organization and to start this project. A stipend of $1,000 a month for a family of four supplemented with food stamps because Kali refused to get the stipend and worked on a full volunteer basis was what we felt needed to happen at this historical juncture. Um, that, that's one part of the actual article, but I'm gonna flip um, to after that. And I'm not gonna read as much as yesterday, but I think. So yeah, these are, these are parts. I'm gonna skip around. Um, so there, actually I'm gonna go a little bit further. Okay, gunshots, yep, that's the same too. Except gunshots in a noisy, busy NYC, LES, Brooklyn, Far Rockway, PJs, aren't as loud as on my Jackson quiet streets. Well, not quiet, quieter. Our block is lined with houses looking like what I grew up thinking were the nicer neighborhoods in Queens and St. Louis. Don't get it twisted though. The block on lock, the trunk stays locked. Glock on cock, the block stays hot. That's a quote from Erica Badu. So I grew up with gunshots and people I knew shot. I was in it, but not of it, in a protective bubble. We've created that bubble for now. Who knows what the future holds? Gun culture in the Deep South is on a whole nother level, and my lightweight pacifist self knows the value of self-defense. Increasingly in the US, what feels more and more like the wild, wild west. Um, let me put that back. They're eight plus years in Jackson, I'm talking about my kids, have been drastically different and still similar to me in community. Hearing, seeing, living a variety, and even more than me, cooperative housing, Fannie Lou Hamer Community Land Trust, worker cooperatives, solidarity economy, economic democracy, membership meetings, planning meetings, meetings, toys circled up for a kids only meeting. Actions, farming, that's called freedom, land and liberation, revolution like IET. Build and fight, I hope they get that part faster than me and in that order. Planting life like I planted a tree in NYC, Thompson Square Park specifically. Um, there's, there's parts that, it's kind of like going back to me being young and then me being a parent and me at different points in this movement. Um, and Okay, I'm just gonna get to this part. What time is it? Is it like 5, 6.30? Okay, all right. So I've been told many times at different points of my life, in order to take care of others, you have to take care of yourself. I believe that, and nine times out of 10, it's been true. And still, there are some times where in order to have the oxygen mask on so I can take a breather, like a full exhale, I've had to get them ready quick and in a hurry, do things for them along the way they are more than capable of doing, do the things I complain about on any other day to get them up and out, out of the way. I mean, what if the conditions of a plane that requires those oxygen masks to drop means you have very little time and doing what they say not to do gives your little person or people a higher rate of survival? I've thought of that in multiple scenarios in my life and work, and I've chosen, at least in my head, to sacrifice my oxygen mask and hold on tight. Mm -hmm. What are you willing to sacrifice to make sure life survives and more than that thrives differently? Thanks. No, I'm just like, like, like the wheels in your mind are turning. No, I would just give you like, we're, 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 that was my, we're late. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.